But the bigger threat is is uh, climate change, which may not the, the difference in temperature might actually allow them to if the vegetation zones move up the mountain, they'll have a bit more habitat for themselves. Mm -hmm. But it isn't just temperature; it's changing rainfall patterns, and all the climate models for the the world at three or four degrees warmer on average yeah. suggest that Central Africa is going to be arid. So all the rainforest species that we're trying to protect now by protecting their habitat are threatened by changes in rainfall because you can have the best protected national park in the world yeah. if it stops raining yeah the trees die the animals that depend on the trees die um, the one bright spot in that bleak scenario is that we now understand that the tropical forests of africa latin america and southeast asia where the non-human primates mostly live some live on the savannah and some live in nearly temperate zones, but mostly they're tropical animals of the forests. Those forests are essential to climate stability. They s sequester and store carbon in the wood and in the peat, if, if it's peat forest, or the soil, the roots. That's taking in the CO2, releasing oxygen, which we like to breathe, and storing the carbon. And we need to protect those forests. But those forests are not just trees. The trees and animals, and the animals are essential for the trees. Most species of tree in the tropics depend on animals for seed dispersal. There are some wind dispersed ones, but between 75 and 95 percent of species in a tropical forest have their seeds dispersed by animals. So you lose the animals, and seeds which have evolved to withstand going through an animal so often they have a very tough covering over the seed to protect it from the digestive juices and the teeth. And if they don't get a bit chewed up and digested, they're so well protected, the water doesn't get in, they don't germinate. So without the animal, very low germination rates. With the animal, dispersal and high germination rates. And of course, they're dispersed in the droppings of the animal, which in terms of elephants and gorillas are sources of great nutri nutrition for the plant. They're packed with nutrients. Um, simple rule of thumb, one elephant in one week produces about one metric ton of first-class <laughs> organic manure. Amazing. Done. Uh, a family of gorillas, ten or a dozen gorillas, likewise. So they're moving around the forest, pruning the trees, breaking off branches, eating the leaves, eating the fruit, dispersing the seeds, and the next generation of trees depends on that. So, although climate change poses a threat to forest-dwelling animals, protecting forest-dwelling animals and their habitat is a central part of our efforts to prevent dangerous climate change. So you save the gorillas and the elephants to save the forests, to save the biosphere. And that wonderful water distribution system isn't there. And of course, it's not just carbon. Yes, yes. Um, yes. forests, um, the, the, the Global Canopy Programme in Oxford estimate that a, a unit area of, of tropical forest puts eight to ten times more water vapour into the atmosphere than the same unit area of ocean. So of course there's also evaporation from the oceans, but the forests are putting even more up because of this, not just evaporation, but transpiration, water being pumped up. So mycelial mats in the soil, all the fungal organisms that put water and nutrients and minerals into the roots of the trees and the trees pump it out into the atmosphere. Um, that sets up what some Russian physicists recently proposed as a sort of biotic pump mm. and draws water vapor in from the oceans to the forest to create a kind of a cyclical effect. And the weather systems that build up over the tropical forests then move westwards across the oceans and get dispersed around the planet. And there's a very nice animated map, which you're welcome to use, um, that, that shows this that a, um, a water in California produced to demonstrate this movement of water. People think of water as liquid form, but much of the water on, on our planet is in gaseous form. Yeah. But we can't see it until it condenses, and then we call it clouds, or we call it rain, or we call it rivers. Um, and if it gets cold, we call it ice. So, so uh, sort of moisture from the Amazon rainforest would be falling in, in sort of Texas or something like that. Uh, and and indeed being blown across the Atlantic and, and 
landing in, in the UK. Um, yes, I, I, I say to people, if you, if you like a glass of wine, whether your wine grows in a vineyard in Spain or France or in California or in Australia or South Africa or New Zealand, you can see on the map of movements of water vapor around the world which tropical forest is helping to water the vineyard. And yet, the way our economy is organized at the moment, not one penny of the price of a bottle of wine goes back to protect the biotic pump that waters the vineyards grows the wine or, or grows the wheat for the bread or anything else that we're eating and, and I think we need to reorder our economy on a global scale so that those economists who currently regard environmental issues as externalities are not really part of the economy whereas obviously to an ecologist they are the foundation of all of our economies because that's what we depend on to live and to eat. So the gorillas and elephants should really be sending us a bill, shouldn't they? They, they certainly should. And, and even, even those enlightened um, uh, enlightened uh, ecologists and experts who have tried to put a value on the services provided to us by these ecosystems and, and suggest that we should be paying for these ecosystem services. And in some countries, Costa Rica is already doing that. They, they tax fossil fuels to pay landowners to grow trees and they've reversed their deforestation rate. Fantastic. That needs to be rolled out around the world. And we need to start including the price of something, something towards the ecosystem services that allow the crops or the wine or whatever it is to be grown in the first place. And, and yet within that ecosystem, no one has looked at the, the value of an individual species or an individual animal. Yeah. Uh, so when people are asking for money to help protect elephants or gorillas, it's because they're nice and, and children like elephants and children do like elephants. Archie, the elephant here, <laughs> is, a, is an elephant ambassador. Um, but I do like to say that although traditionally people have valued the white bits that stick out the front of the elephant, yeah. um, and some people ethically say, well, what's in the mind of the elephant with a brain four times the size of ours uh, is important too. They have a right to exist, we would argue. Um, but in terms of the ecology, it's what comes out of this end of the elephant, which is more important. Yeah. And wh whereas tourism can bring a lot of money that can help to protect national parks so that real elephants can survive, whether or not the tourist ever sees an elephant, he's still eating about 4% of his or her body weight every day mm. in vegetation and putting the undigested vegetation and seeds out at the other end in the dung, miles from the parent plant, producing the next generation of trees, which will then take in and store the carbon that we're churning out with our burning of fossil fuels. Yeah. So elephants are really important. Yeah. And what is really worrying about elephants and the great apes, actually, is that if you look at estimates of what the population was 150 years ago, when gorillas were first described, we don't know how many there were, but it must have been millions. Mm. And how many elephants were there 150 years ago? Um, some people have said 10 million, some people have said 20, 20 something million, but it's they're all estimates. Yeah. But the reality is now we have a tiny percentage of that. We have lost 90 something percent of the, the workforce, the gardeners of the forest, those who prune and, and plow and um, disperse nutrients and dung and seeds. And what we're faced with now is forests that are struggling to keep up with the CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions that, that humans are pumping into the atmosphere. We need the forests more and more, and yet the very animals who are responsible for the next generation of trees in those same forests are being killed because they've got white bits at the front that can be made into knickknacks and ornaments, or they're made of meat, yeah. and you can eat the meat, or some other reason that gives them a, a direct economic benefit to the guy who's shooting them. And, and those people are completely unaware of the, the role that these animals play in the ecology of their area and the forest on which they depend for their food and their timber and their other needs, medicinal herbs, whatever. Um, this idea that, that they're part of a much bigger global um, ecosystem is, is, is not widely understood, even by the politicians and corporate leaders who are taking decisions about what to do with this patch of forest. Well, that's big enough. Let's let's put a road through there and, and take that bit for a mine and that bit for a plantation. 
and the elephants are maybe with what's left, yeah. rather than thinking, ooh, well, if we've lost um, 80 or 90% of the forest in that country, um, we actually can't afford to lose any more because we wouldn't have the rainfall and the carbon storage and the other things that those ecosystems require. And if we're not putting any money in to protect the animals, even if this generation of trees lives to old age, there won't be a new generation of trees. Yeah. <laughs> the final twist in this story about the importance of elephants and climate change is uh, uh, botanical researchers have noted a correlation between seed size and wood density. So hmm. um, a tropical rainforest giant that, that takes half a dozen people to put their arms around it, stretching up above the canopy, the result of an ecological event perhaps five or six or seven hundred years ago when a gorilla or an elephant ate a seed and pooped it out and then it grew into this tree. If this tree happens to have a seed that is fist size, it needs an elephant to eat it. If it's about this size, it needs a gorilla to eat it. And without a gorilla or an elephant, those particular trees don't reproduce successfully. Um, if it's got a seed this size, then birds can eat it. And even if there's only relatively small fruit eating birds left, they might continue to survive. But the role of apes and elephants, and, and in Latin America, the larger monkeys and tapirs, is to disperse the heavier seeds. And the heavier seeds grow into trees with denser wood. So the amount of carbon stored in a unit area of forest is greater in a forest with those species that have large seeds and dense wood than in a forest which has seeds which are small or wind dispersed and light wood. So again, um, the biodiverse forests are better at storing um, carbon than uh, plantations. And therefore we need to protect the biodiverse forests and the animals therein so that they continue to play this role in, in maintaining climate stability.